Dombey and Son. From London, we present an eight-part serial for radio, adapted by H. Oldfield Box from the novel by Charles Dickens. Part one, in which Mr. Dombey's dearest wish is fulfilled. Dombey sat in the corner of the darkened room in the great armchair at his wife's bedside. And son, a babe newborn, lay tucked up warm in a little basket bedstead nearby. Mr. Dombey, usually so cold and self-contained, was exulting. At last, after ten years of marriage, the one overwhelming desire of his life had been fulfilled. A son. A son. At last, Fanny, the great business my grandfather founded will be Dombey and Son. Not only in name, but in fact. Dombey and Son. Yes, it will. He will be christened Paul. My name and my father's. Of course, Mr. Dombey. Where's Florence? Where's my little girl? She's here... Florence. Yes, Papa? If you like, you may take a look at your pretty little brother. Don't touch him. No, Papa. Mama. Oh, Mama. Oh, Florence, my sweet, my love, my darling. Mama. That's enough, Florence. We want no exaggerated emotion, if you please. You had better go away. Oh, Papa. Must I? You heard what I said. Go back to your nursery. No, 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 Paul, not yet. Lauren, kiss me. Hold my hand. Oh, this won't do. This won't do at all. Lawrence, go now. No. Oh, no, let us stay. Let us stay to the last. It, it won't be much longer. Fanny, what do you mean? You are overexciting yourself. You need sleep. Ah, Mrs. Bucket, there you are. Come here, your patient is restless. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, now, ma'am. Florence. My little Florence. <sighs> ma'am. Ma'am. Mr. Jombie, she's gone. She's dead, sir. She's dead. Poor brother, my poor Paul. But she didn't fight. She made no effort to live. No, Louisa, that's the truth, I'm afraid. Fanny, with all her merits, lacked spirit. But, Louisa, the boy survives. My son lives. Yes, brother, the boy survives. And it is he we must think of. You have brought that woman you mentioned to nurse him. She's in the hall. Shall I bring her in? If you please. I'll call her. Come in, Mrs. Toodle. My brother will see you now. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Well, ma'am, I won't waste words. My sister has told you the circumstances. You have uh, children of your own. Oh, yes, sir. Five of them. The eldest a boy of ten and the youngest a little girl of eight weeks. And my husband... If you please, madam, I'm a busy man. Let us keep to the point. Very good, sir. My son must be fed. My sister has recommended you. You have come, I understand, prepared to take up residence here forthwith on the terms she has mentioned to you. Oh, yes, sir, immediately. Though I'm sure, as you'll know, sir, what a wrench it is leaving my husband and my own little ones. Yes, yes. There ain't a more devoted family, I'm sure, in all London. But there it is, we need the money, and our sister, sir, who lives with us and will look after him while I'm away. I am not interested in your financial circumstances, nor in your domestic arrangements. My terms are generous. Oh, yes, sir, very. I think so. But, Mrs. Toodle, there is one condition that I must insist upon. Yes, sir. While you are here, all your attention must be given to my son. 
Only if some emergency arises, will you visit your own family. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And two things more. I do not wish you to become attached to my child, or he to you. You have come here to perform certain duties. And when they are done, when you return home, you will cease, if you please, to remember him. Very well, sir. And, uh, finally, your name. My name, sir? Toodle. You cannot be known by a name such as that in this house. No, indeed. What is your Christian name? Polly, sir. Polly? That won't do either. Oh. Louisa, can you suggest one more fitting... Uh, let me see. Uh, how about Richards, brother? Will that do? Richards? You will have no objection to being called Richards, ma'am? No, none at all, sir. Well, that's all, I think. Louisa, if you will now be good enough to take Mrs. Richards upstairs to little Paul's nursery. Yes, brother. Come, Mrs. Toodle. That is Richards. If you please, may I come in? Of course, love. Of course you may. You're Miss Florence, I suppose. Yes, I've been away. My Aunt Louisa took me away to stay with her after after my darling mamma died till 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 the funeral was over, my pretty. Yes. Oh mamma. Oh mamma. There, love. There, try to be brave. I will try. I will. Oh, is that my brother? It is your own dear little brother Paul, what I've come to nurse. May I kiss him, please? That you may. Thank you. Oh, isn't he sweet? I've got a nurse, too. Her name is Susan. Susan Nipper. Is it, then? But she's not grown up like you are. She's only 14. Oh, here she is. Here is Susan. Yes, Miss Floyd. Here I am. I've been looking for you. My, wouldn't your pa be angry? You know it was tickly given out that you wasn't to go and worry at the wet nurse. Oh, don't worry me. I'm very fond of children. Don't it, Mrs. Richards? I'm very fond of periwinkles. But it don't follow the sun to have them for tea. Well, it don't matter. I'll thank you to remember, if you'll be so good, Miss Floyd's under my charge and Master Paul's under yourn. I won't trespass and I'll thank you not to. But still we needn't quarrel. It's natural she should want to see her brother. The poor child's so unhappy. But you won't be, will you, love, when you see your papa again when he gets home from the city? No, Richard. No, Mrs. Richard, don't. <laughs> see her, pa? I should like to see her do it. Won't she, then? No, no. Her pa's a great deal too wrapped up in somebody else. And before there was a somebody else, she never was a favourite. What a little darling like her. Dolls are thrown away in this house, Mrs. Richards. He ain't seen her since. Not once. Well... Before that... He hadn't set eyes on her for months and months. If he met her in the street tomorrow, I don't think he'd know her for his own child. You surprise me. Well, that's how it is. And it's a hearty shame, for I know she feels it. Now then, Miss Floyd, come along. Time for bed. Yes, Susan. Goodbye, my pretty. Goodbye. But I'll come and see you again soon. And Susan will let me, won't you, Susan? Well, it ain't right of you to ask of it, Miss Floyd, for you know that I'm fond of you and I can't refuse you nothing. Your pa said you wasn't to. Oh, please. Mrs. Richards, I dare say we'll see what can be done. Of course I will. It ain't right that the two little ones should be kept apart. I'm willing, I'm sure, Mrs. Richards, to live friendly if the means can be found without going openly against orders. This great, dark, gloomy house ain't so exactly ringing with merrymaking that one need be lonelier than one must. No, indeed. I may not be wanting a life of frivolity, Mrs. Richards, but it don't follow that I want to shut myself up in a mausoleum. I'll see what I can do, Susan. I'll think of a way somehow of getting round the master. Though he ain't one who's easy to approach on any subject, I must say. That he ain't. I don't mind working, Mrs Richards, but that don't mean I'm partial to being employed by a rock of granite, who probably ain't even aware of my existence. <sighs> now then, Miss Floyd, you're bad dog, come along. Yes, Susan. Poor little mite. And so lonely. I know what. I'll get round him by means of the boy. That's what I'll do. The very next time I see him. Good morning, Richards. Oh, good morning, sir. How is Master Paul today? Oh, quite thriving, sir, and well. Hmm, he looks so. The servants look after you well, I hope. You have everything that you want, I trust. Oh, thank you, yes, sir. Uh, that is... Uh... Well, 
There, there is one thing, sir, as I'll make so bold as to mention. And what is that? Well, sir, it's my belief as nothing so good for making children lively and cheerful as seeing other children playing about them. I think I mentioned to you, Richards, when first you came here, that I wished you to see as little of your own family as possible. Well, and I hadn't seen him. It wasn't that that I meant, sir. What then did you mean? If his sister, if little Miss Florence could be with him... His sister? You really think that sort of society would be good for my son? I do, sir. Nothing better. Very well, Richards, if that is your opinion. Anything that may assist my son's well-being, I am prepared to agree to. Well, my carriage is waiting. I must get along to the city. Come in. You asked to see the new boy in the county house, sir. Young Walter Gay, sir. He's here now. Very well, send him in. Yes, sir. My, sir. So you are young Gay, the son of the... Uh, oh, I've forgotten his name. The, the ship's uh, instrument maker. Uh, Solomon Gill, sir. Uh, not his son. I'm his nephew. But I've lived with him all my life. Yes, yes, yes. I said, nephew. It was your ambition, I understand, to go to sea. Uh, it was, sir. But my uncle's becoming an old man, and I'm all he has in the world. And his business is not what it used to be. I am not concerned with his business, young man, nor in future must you be. You are now an employee, a very junior employee, of one of the greatest houses in the city of London. See that you're attentive and punctual, as I expect all my employees to be. Should you be kept late at the end of the day, don't consider yourself harshly treated. No, sir. I'm often kept late myself. Everyone is when the pressure of work requires it. Well, that is all. You may now return to the county house. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Where's Walter? Where's that nephew of mine? If I didn't know he was too fond of me to make a run of it and entered himself aboard a ship against my wishes, I should begin to be fidgety. I really should. Ah, <laughs> oh, there he is, coming into the shop at last. Is that you, Walter? Hello. Hello, Uncle Saul. Walter. Have you been getting on without me all day? It's dinner ready. I'm hungry. Yes, I've got on very well, thank you. And as to your being hungry, the dinner's been ready half an hour. They kept you beyond the proper time, I suppose. They did, Uncle. And they do almost every day, I understand. Yeah, it's fortunate, then, that you live so close. Here, come and sit down. I'm hungry, too. Here, here. There you are. Thank you. Yeah. Well, how did you get on your first day with Dombey and Son? Hmm. All right, I think. At any rate, no one complained. But, Uncle, it's a precious dark set of offices they've got. In the room where I sit, there's a high fender, and an iron safe, and some cards about ships that are going to sail, and an almanac, and some old boxes, and a lot of cobwebs. One of them just over my head. Oh, anything else? Oh, nothing else except clerks and stools and ledgers. Oh, th there's an old parrot cage. A parrot cage, eh? I wonder how that ever came mm. there. <laughs> and who was it told you what to do? Mm, Mr. Carker. Mm. He's Mr. Dombey's manager. Oh, can't say I liked him. And Mr. Morfin, the assistant manager. Mr. Morfin's an elderly gentleman. Very nice indeed. Uh, you, you didn't see Mr. Dombey, I suppose? Oh, yes. The clerk took me to his room. And he told me, Mr. Dombey, I mean, that I was to work hard and be attentive and punctual and not minded if the hours were long. I thought he didn't seem to like me much. You mean, my boy, that you didn't seem to like him much? Oh, well, oh, perhaps so. I never thought of that. He was pretty sharp with me, I must say. Oh, he is, I believe, with everyone. But whatever your feelings about him may be, you must try not to show them, Wally, for your own sake. Oh, I won't, and I'm sure I didn't. Good. Uncle, hmm? did you have any customers today? Oh, none. Oh. There was one man who came in to ask the way to somewhere or other, but no one wanted to buy anything. Mm. But there it is, the, the wooden midshipman, once such a prosperous little business, has had its day. Uh, the truth is, Wally, I'm behind the times. Oh, Uncle, there isn't a clever man living at uh, making the instruments you make. Did make. The shop's full of them, full to overflowing. But the ships no longer buy them from me. Uh, the world's gone past me, Wally. I hardly know where I am myself, much less where my customers are. Never mind them, Uncle. We'll pull through together. Uh, I hope so. Indeed, I don't doubt it, but... 
It's a hard world. I know it is. That's why I want you to be early in it. A career in the city isn't what you'd have chosen for yourself, I know. Yours is an adventurous spirit. I'd never leave you, Uncle. You know that. I do, Wally. But it isn't myself I'm thinking about. Dombey and Sonny's a great house, and you may rise high in it. Spell, be diligent, my boy, as Mr. Dombey said. Try to like it. I will. I do everything I can to deserve your good opinion of me. And your affection. Thank you, my boy. Hello, uh, Hello, my Oh, friend. Captain Cuttle. Come in, dear old friend. I will come in, girls. Uh, I am in. Uh, well, Gills, me man of science. Well, Walla, my lad, how goes it? Oh, well... Ned, you looked in at exactly the right moment. Oh. I'm just going to open a bottle of my Madeira uh -huh. to mark Wally's entry into the world of commerce. And you, as the best and oldest friend we've got, shall drink it with us. Ah, oh, thank you, girls. Oh. Thank you. Oh, but, Uncle, the, the wonderful old Madeira... Why, you've only got two bottles left. Oh, never mind that. You shall drink the other bottle, my boy, when you come to good fortune. Mm. Uh, oh, that's good. Uh, I and fortune will come to him, Gills, for there isn't a brighter and better lad living, or one more deserving of it. Mm. Uh, thank you, Gills, old friend. Uh, success, Waller. Health, wealth, and happiness. Success, Wally. <laughs> thank you. Uh, mm. Stand by, Gills. And I'll give the boy some. Of course. Uh, it ain't the life that would have suited me. A life on the briny ocean, that's what mine's been. And I don't regret it. So it brought me no riches and cost me my right hand. And I have to make do with this hook instead of it. But I haven't a doubt that my shipmate Wara is a firm set on a voyage to prosperousness. <laughs> a success, Wara. Thank you. And uh, now, Ned, we'll drink to the firm... Dombey and son. It may be Walters one day, at any rate in part. Who knows? Remember Sir Richard Whittington who married his master's daughter? Uh, <laughs> aye, aye. Turn again, <laughs> Whittington, Lord Mayor of London. That's it. Walter, my lad, marry a master's daughter. Uh, mm. But perhaps Mr. Dombey hasn't a daughter. Mm. Oh, he has, Uncle. Mm -hmm. Some of them were talking about it in the office today. Oh? She's a little girl of six. They said, Uncle, that he's taken a dislike to her and that she's left unnoticed among the servants, that it's only his baby son whom he cares about. <laughs> there, Ned. He knows all about her already. Aye, 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 so he does. Gills, I smell romance in the air. Oh, <laughs> nonsense. How can I help hearing what they tell me? Uh, well, well, but it does seem, Ned, that the sun's a little in our way at present. Very much in the way. Yeah, uh -huh. Nevertheless, Wally, we'll drink to him. So here's to Dombey and son. <laughs> Very well, Uncle. But since you've made mention of Miss Dombey and connected me with her, I'll make bold to amend the toast. So here's to Dombey and son and daughter. Uh, here's, here's to Dombey and son and daughter. daughter. Hey? Excuse me, Mr. Dombey, sir. I understand that you wish to see me. I do, Richards. Close the door and come here. Yes, sir. Richards, you have been here six months, and your duties have been carried out entirely to my satisfaction. Thank you, sir. Today, as you know, my son has been christened. And desiring to connect some little service to you with the occasion, I have consulted with my sister, Mrs. Chick, here, and... Uh, Louisa, tell Richards what I have done. Yes, Paul. Richards, your master is a governor of a school in the city. The Charitable Grinders. A foundation, Richards, for the sons of the poor. And having at this time the power to nominate a pupil... I have nominated your eldest son, Robert, I believe is his name. Well, it is, sir, but we call him Rob. Never mind what you call him. <clears throat> in general, though, I think the working classes should not be educated. But... Ma'am, the Charitable Grinders is an institution where the boys, while receiving instruction, are taught also to remember their proper position in the world. Exactly. A special and distinctive uniform is worn. Uh, Louisa, perhaps you will tell Richards what this consists of. Yes, Paul. The dress is a nice, warm, blue, beige tail coat and cap, turned up with orange-coloured binding, red worsted stockings and very strong leather small clothes. Provided, I may add, by the institution. 
The pupils there are known not by name, but by number. Your son's number is, I believe, 147. Is it... is it a boarding school, sir? No, Richards, it is a day school. And the uniform must be worn at all times and all seasons, at school and at home. You mean, sir, that he must wear it on his way to the school? Naturally. Why not? I, well, I just wondered, sir. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm greatly obliged to you, I'm sure. In the street, summer and winter, think of it, Susan. I suppose I ought to feel grateful, but, oh, dear, poor Rob... Think how the boys in the street will make fun of him. Well, Mrs. Richards, the clothes may be warm, but charity's cold, and that's all there is to it. I don't know what I wouldn't give to see the poor little dear before he gets used to them. Then I'll tell you what, Mrs. Richards, see him and make your mind easy. Well, Mr. Dombey wouldn't like that. Oh, wouldn't he? He'd like it very much, I think, if he was asked. You wouldn't ask him at all, I suppose. No, quite contrary. Bless me, you ain't seen your burns in all the time you've been here. No, I haven't. Then, Mrs. Richards, what we'll do is this. Tomorrow afternoon, when we take Miss Floyd and Master Paul for their walk, we'll walk a little further and in a different direction from usual. To my home, you mean? I do. But, Susan, suppose Mr. Dombey should find out. He won't. How could he? And bless me, Mrs. Richards, we may draw our wages out of him, but that don't mean as where his bond slave. And so, after much hesitation, Richards agreed to this plan. And the visit was paid to the delirious delight of her family. But alas, on their way back, disaster overtook them. It happened to be market day. A thundering cry of, Mad Bull! A Mad Bull is loose! was raised. And in the resulting confusion of people running up and down and shouting, in the resulting melee... Little Florence found herself separated from her companions. The earth, it seemed, had opened and swallowed them up. And she screamed and ran. And ran on, wild with terror, till she could run no further. Susan! Susan! Oh, dear, where are they? Where are they? But at this moment, an old woman, a very ugly and dirty old woman with red rims round her eyes, came hobbling towards her. Where are they? Why did you run away from them? I, I was frightened. I, I didn't know what I did. I thought, oh dear, where are they? I'll show you. Now come with me. I know where they are. Oh, do you really? Of course I do. Oh, thanks. Uh, come along. You come along with me, dearie. And with this, the old woman seized her hand and off they went together. But they had not gone far by some very uncomfortable places, such as brick fields and tile yards, when the old woman turned down a dirty lane where the mud lay deep in black ruts and stopped before a shabby little hovel that seemed almost to be falling to pieces. Now then, in you go. But, but they're not here. They can't be. No, they're not but you are, ain't you? No, let me go. No, young miss. Not till I've got what I want of you. What do you want? Them pretty clothes you're wearing. I can get money for them. Good money. Oh, no, please, please don't. I'm not going to hurt you. I ain't going to keep you long. No. Only do as I tell you. No. Take off their pretty dress. No. And their petticoat. Oh. And them shoes and stockings, too. Now, come along. Sharp now. Oh, no, please. And having divested her of these garments, the old woman clothed her in some wretched substitutes which she produced from a heap of rags. And then, seizing her wrist again, conducted her forth through a labyrinth of narrow streets and alleys till at length the clatter of traffic from a main thoroughfare became audible. And now I'll leave you to find your own way as best you're able. That's the city ahead of you. You know where you live, I suppose, and can ask your way. And again Florence was alone. But she knew that the city was where her father's offices were situated. It was to them that she would ask the way. And summoning all her courage, she walked forward.
But Florence in her rags looked very different from Florence in the fine clothes that had been stolen from her. Please, sir. If you please, sir. Can you tell me the way? Oh, please, sir. No, no one heeded her. And it must have been a full two hours after she had started upon this strange adventure when she found herself at the entrance to a kind of wharf or landing place close to the riverside. Oh, if you please, sir. Oh, now then, little girl, be off. We know your kind, always come in begging. I'm not begging. I don't want anything, thank you, except to know the way to Dombey and Son. Oh, hey. What can you want with Dombey and Sons? Only to know the way there, if you please. Oh, well, if that's all. Joe? Joe? Yes, Charlie? Uh, where's that young spark of Dombey's who's been watching the shipment of them goods? Boy, by the name of Walter, ain't he? That's right, Walter Gay. Yeah. He's just gone, I think. Oh, no, there he is. Come over, young fella. You're wanted. All right, just come in. Uh, well, yes... Yeah. You're from Dombey's, ain't you? Yes. Well, look here, then. Here's a little girl who's asking the way there. Asking the way? Why? What's the matter? I... I'm lost, if you please. Lost? Yes, sir. All long way from here. I've had my clothes taken away since... And I'm not dressed in my own now. Well, my name is Florence, and I'm Mr. Dombey's daughter. Dombey's daughter? Oh, bless my soul. Oh, dear, I, I'm so tired. Oh, take care of me, if you please. I'll take care of you. Don't cry, Miss Dombey. I'll tell you what. Yes? I've just finished. I'll take you to the wooden midshipman. That's where I live with my uncle. It's quite near. And he'll look after you while I go to your home and tell your father you've been found. And have some proper clothes brought to you. Oh, thank you. Now, don't cry any more, Miss Dombey. I won't. I'm, I'm not really. I'm only crying for joy. Oh, dear, you're so kind. I'll never forget you. Never. As long as I live. And thus it was that Walter and Florence first met. And Florence paid her first visit to the wooden midshipman, where Uncle Sol, as astonished as he was delighted, was instantly captivated by her pretty face and her sweetness. But the part Walter had played in rescuing Florence brought him no increased favour in Mr. Dombey's eyes. And as for Mrs. Richards, she was dismissed instantly. And so little Paul lost his second mother, and his sister who cried herself mournfully to sleep that night, lost a good and true friend. That was part one of Dombey and Son, adapted by H. Oldfield Box from the book by Charles Dickens. Mr. Dombey was played by Rafe Truman, Florence by Judith Stott, Walter by Martin Starkey, and Solomon Gills by Ivan Sampson. The play was produced for the BBC by Claire Choville. <laughs>